So let me officially begin by uh, welcoming everybody. Um, it's a warm afternoon for a lot of us here. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today on this webinar session. Um, so I'd like to begin by giving you a quick uh, uh, brief about Met Piper, who are the organizers for the day. Met Piper is a Bangalore-based uh, health startup. They have a vision to connect with the right talent with the right opportunity. That starts with doctors and healthcare professionals, with hospitals and healthcare organizations, clinical assignments and partnerships with pharmaceutical companies and manufacturers. All of this by leveraging the right technology. They are playing a very important role in this pandemic by providing online tools to make telecommunication processes even better and even easier. So in amidst all of this pandemic, uh, today's webinar session is brought, they brought together a panel of doctors to address an important topic, something that will be, um, you know, very um, imminent in, in the face of this pandemic. What is our preparedness to combat mucomycosis disease or better known as the black fungus and the white fungus disease? I'd like to introduce our panelists for the day. Our first speaker will be Dr. Satyendra Narayan Singh, who is a professor and HOD, Department of Microbiology, Partner Medical College Hospital. He has 25 plus years of experience and has published numerous papers from his research work on various topics, which include chikungunya fever, HIV, or the prevalence of multidrug resistance and extended spectral beta lactamases among neuropathogenic E. coli isolates in urban and tertiary care hospitals in North India. These are just to name a few. So I would not be over exaggerating if I say we have a very experienced professional amidst us today. Without much ado, I will open the session for Dr. Satyendra Narayan Singh's presentation. Over to you, sir. Actually, uh, as we know, is a fungal infection. It is caused by a particular species of the three main genera. Infant, lupus, and bacteria. Infant is very important. That's why it is called the disease produces from nuclear microbes. which is a nuclear microbes, is very, very common. Now, how bad is infection? Mode of infection is usually by inhalation of this and the exposure. And which are uh, these exposures are present in air, soil, and decaying oil. Normally, the healthy, healthy individual it doesn't cause infection because of good immunity in them. But infection, uh, but when the immunity is so, it attacks. The fungus attacks and uh, causes disease. So it, it, it is going to attack us once, once our immunity becomes weak. That is why it is called, it is called opportunistic fungus. And what are the, the risk factors? The risk factors are low immunity, as I have told, uncontrolled diabetes, age patients, and uh, malignancy, because I have been in the person who has uh, the one part of it, that is kidney cancer, and immunodeficient, like age patients, or the therapy of chronic a primary infection is used to the the upper respiratory tract or low. It may, but in the way, it may involve lower respiratory tract also. It's called pulmonary nasal mycosis. The features of which may resemble corona nasal mycosis. So we can confuse. We see this pulmonary nasal mycosis with corona nasal supply. This is very, very important. Uh, apart from the region it, it causes in those, that is called the uh, basal uh, line of basal uh, From those, you can, you, can, you can go to orbit, you can go further to brain. 
Another form of it to Michael T. Castle is a of it is very form. Or it is made to uh, other organs of it, especially uh, it may Suppose uh, pulmonary nuclear mitosis is there. If pulmonary nuclear mitosis is there, we can confuse it with the coron. And from there, we can uh, go to other parts of the body. Now, this is uh, uh, most commonly these days we are seeing the interval stop increase this from due to mitosis. It is because of mainly two factors are there. The first factor is over, over dose or excessive use of steroids. The steroids are life saving, no doubt, but the excessive use is possible. If an if if a steroid is used for more than three days, it may cause the uh, case of fresh immunity leading to mutual mitosis. Mutual mitosis. Uh, so mutual or if high dose is given to a patient or at least one week, that situation also this apart from the six months may cause mutual mitosis. So this is another these days. Previously in first wave mutual mitosis cases were not uh, we didn't come across or we hardly we hardly had uh, any case of mutual mitosis in first wave. First wave of corona. But in second wave in our country, not in lots of cases to my mind, I think industrial oxygen which they use may be one of the factors that the oxygen is not very as good as biological oxygen or medical oxygen. So this may be one of the reasons. And now another reason is of course hygiene. Hygiene is too for that. Properly sterilized can be processed. Due to our finest of oxygen cylinders, the mask is not good frequently. Our apologies again, it's taking slightly longer. Um, Samir, do we have an update? Would we be able to get him back? Uh, one moment, I'm just checking their office. Just give me a moment. While we wait for Samir's update, um, I just want to keep all the participants informed. If you do have any questions, um, there is a question and answer um, uh, pop-up box where you can post your questions. Audio um, questions will not be available. However, you can post your questions and the panelists will take them up during the Q&A sessions. The most important point I would like to press upon is that usually we be confused whenever on the HRCC, a patient complaining of low oxygen, falling oxygen saturation comes to us. We straight away, we are, the, we, are the, we suppose that this is a case of corona. If before, before, if uh, RTPCR is positive or rapid antigen is positive, okay. okay. It may be corona, but if these tests are negative, we should think otherwise also. And what this otherwise, we should think for some fungal disease. Fungal disease is the most common. Um, how should we this? How should how should we differentiate? We should do the sputum examination, microscopy or culture. And the sputum, when we examine the sputum, we can get high fever or um, uh, First, but uh, and on culture, culture is uh, almost understood as density. 
culture is very very sensitive so there is no harm waiting for another 24 to 48 hours because that will differentiate between the two leaks whether it is fungal leak or uh, corona leak I, I have i have had, i have come across two such cases and the patient recovered on uh, by by giving anti fungal test candida was involved that is why quite fungal now another point i would like to interest upon is that suppose the patient is having is undergoing treatment a steroid treatment on a steroid therapy and the patient is being treated in the hospital and if patient is not improving then we should think otherwise also um, we should think for something else also and and what and this something else is super added fungal infection because patients receiving steroids their immunity is suppressed in that situation these opportunistic fungi may uh, uh, may infect and which uh, which may be the reason why the patient is the patient of coronary disease and the treatment and uh, on um, the long of the right therapy is not responding so we should think otherwise also we should go for investigation fungal investigation also because the sputum should be damaged because the sputum is coming from within coming from lung so the sputum is 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 examined and the sputum examination ko preparation we can go for ko preparation which will be the fungal hygiene and uh, we are uh, we can type by type calculate on the fda medium that is fungal disease next day will be uh, as it goes of white fungal or black fungal maximum the day after tomorrow next day for the within 48 hours will be detected so we should uh, think now uh, my this is think uh, otherwise in um, in corona patient and i'm sure this is fungal aspect is taken into consideration many patients were not in proving in the hospital if and, and uh, after being given antifungal treatment they should be treated because one of my friends um, here the pro head of technology uh, uh, his, his wife recovered from corona recently and he was uh, the she was also uh, having this and the one uh, one attack to see some people uh, start that uh, we responded with antifungal treatment and antibiotic treatment so uh, antifungal treatment is also the case of fungal treatment that's it those patients who have recovered will have a fever and in those patients who are uh, not recovering to them also super added fungal infection to be taken into account so my my suggestion will be that these fungal diseases these are opportunities for them that is uh, the patients who are having a steroid therapy for the patient these opportunities for them they invade their body the reason of which they limit the reason of for them हाँ सर वी जस्ट सी लाइक इफ वी हैव एनी क्वेश्चन एट द मोमेंट और मे बी वी कैन टेक ऑल द क्वेश्चन इन द एंड ठीक है डॉक्टर गायत्री यू कैन टेक ओवर thank you samya thank you doctor for taking time off your schedule to educate and share your thoughts i'd also like to thank the audience for their kind cooperation at this juncture over to the next speaker we've got with us dr gopal ramani md department of medicine at albert einstein college of medicine jacobi medical center and montefiore medical center 
after completing his bachelor's of medicine and bachelor's of surgery from Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute, Chennai, he moved to New York as a resident at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Jacobi Medical Center in internal medicine. His contribution to the treatment and care of patients during the pandemic has been lauded greatly and recognized as a major reason the Jacobi Center was able to discharge a majority of severely infected COVID-19 patients back home. In the words of Dr. Robert Hailashe, who chairs the Department of Medicine at Jacobi Medical Center, Gokul is a true hero and a great asset to humanity. It is really an honor to have you amidst us addressing our audience today, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, Ms. yes, Kathy, yes. Ms. Excellent. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. So, uh, so let's start. So we'll start with the agenda for today. We're going to briefly go through a problem statement. We're going to go through the overview of uh, COVID-19 related mucomycosis, CAMCAR. We're going to speak about the challenges and possible contributing factors. We're going to talk about some red flags and diagnosis and the diagnostic criteria. And uh, we'll also touch briefly on uh, colloquially what is called the white fungus or the uh, Candida aureus. Uh, which is a nosocomial infection. And we'll also talk about a solution statement and we'll conclude the talk with some questions. So the second wave of the COVID pandemic seems to have hit India really hard. I can actually relate to what's actually going on now because last year in March, it hit New York really hard. And uh, I was in the front lines uh, on the COVID floors and uh, yeah, it was a really tough time. So I really understand uh, what's actually going on in India. And many of you guys might be working in the front lines and uh, I tip my hat to all you guys. I'm here to support you guys however I can. And that's why I'm here. Um, India has seen over 4 lakh cases during its peak uh, as shown in this chart. This is the data from the WHO. Um, and uh, even though uh, the cases have been reducing, India is still contributing to about 45% of the new cases detected globally and about uh, 30% of deaths uh, seen in the third week of May. This is the latest data that I have from the WHO weekly COVID situation update. This is accessible from the WHO website. Well, as the number continues to stabilize, another threat seems to have emerged during this challenge in the form of uh, COVID associated mucormycoses, colloquially known as the black fungus in the media, as I've been seeing uh, in the news in many parts of India. I'm going to refer to this as, uh, as, uh, as CAMCAR or COVID associated mucormycosis. The incident seems to have jumped very rapidly during the second wave, about eight to 14,000 cases, depending on what the source is, mostly from the media. Uh, Gujarat alone seems to have recorded 3,700 cases as of May, followed by Maharashtra uh, in the last month, even though uh, no official figures about mucormycosis were available uh, by the Union Health Ministry during the first wave of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, India has contributed to approximately 71% of the documented cases of mucormycosis based on published literature from December 2019 uh, till April 2021. Several states have already started making their own task forces uh, with others, most recently Delhi, uh, declaring that it's an epidemic and a notifiable disease to health authorities. In fact, I just learned that there were restrictions uh, in Delhi about uh, talking about the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, Since we have some viewers from Delhi, I would be, uh, I'd be restricting my talk uh, in order to uh, make sure that we cover all the legal implications. So um, COVID-19 related, uh, related mucormycosis is a, is a well-known complication, not just in coronavirus states. Um, it's also a very well-known complication of uncontrolled diabetes, immunocompromised states, like being on immunosuppressive medications for medical reasons, like post-transplant patients, patients with a weakened immune system, hematological malignancies, some environmental factors, because uh, as uh, as Dr. Singh just said, uh, mucus spores are floating around in the environment. It can be a combination of all these things, and COVID itself is an is is a state of immunocompromised situation. Several uh, patient related factors, um, for ex uh, say for example, diabetes. Diabetes is the most common reason uh, why patients get. Uh, COVID uh, get uh, mucormycosis and diabetes is a severely immunocompromised state, specifically uh, DKA. And I'll touch into why in just a moment. Uh, this chart represents a pictographic representation of the distribution of diabetes as per the, uh, the diabetes atlas. This is also available 
online on the Diabetes Atlas of the International Diabetes Federation. This shows that uh, per every thousand cases, the rate is about 1,400. Incidence of diabetes is quite high um, in, in India and in, in Southeast Asia in general. Uh, evidence suggests that COVID-19 induces damage to the pancreatic islets. This results in acute diabetes and uh, potentially DKA, but in my experience, mostly uh, acute diabetes. Uh, we've also been using a lot of steroids to treat patients. So you know, we've been having to use a lot of insulin and, uh, and you know, evidence by some studies. This is a study that actually predates uh, the, the pandemic. This is a study from 2009, uh, more than a decade before we are seeing this kind of pandemic. And um, COVID-19 patients, uh, diabetes is a classic risk factor for mucor. And it's with increased morbidity and mortality in COVID. Hosts may have pre-existing conditions like just as we talked about diabetes, they might be even really sick, requiring uh, mechanical ventilation, ARDS, evolving pneumonia. They have to go to the ICU level of care, and they've been treated with immunosuppressive drugs, evidence-based, of course. Uh, we have uh, the recovery trial. The recovery trial is a key trial that actually uh, found out that dexamethasone helps these patients. And uh, immunosuppressive drugs like uh, anti-interleukin-6 medications like tocilizumab uh, also suppresses your immune system. DKA is associated with mucormycosis classically, which is the teaching that, that we learn about in medical school, and uh, it is very evidence-based. And COVID patients are predisposed to DKA since being on multiple immunosuppressive medications, namely steroids. So let's talk about the cellular mechanism. So clinical evidence suggests that phagocytes are the main host defense mechanism. It is known that patients who are neutropenic uh, from hematological malignancies or being on certain medications are predisposed to developing mucor. Uh, dysfunctional phagocytes due to multiple factors also impair the phagocytic opsonization and even movement to kill the organism by both oxidative and non-oxidative means. Uh, DKA and acidosis has been shown to impair phagocytic functions. Mechanisms are really unknown. There are several studies that show several different mechanisms. It's beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but you know it has been shown to impair the cellular mechanisms of fighting disease. These studies were actually done in mice, and they have its own limitations. And you know, human mucor interactions may have a different relationship, but this is the best data that we have. Uh, talking about the host pathogen relationship, there are very complex interactions between the host, that is a human that's infected with the virus, and pathogens that may be impaired, and, pa and pathogenesis that may be impaired in these pathological and pharmacological states. To cause disease, mucormycosis must scavenge from the host sufficient iron for its growth. In normal host, the primary defense mechanism is sequestration of iron into the serum by special iron binding proteins. We know that in infections, we know that the ferritin goes up. In COVID, we use ferritin as an, an acute phase reactant as, uh, as a means of monitoring. We used to check labs on our patients every so often as per whatever institutional guidelines here in our my institute, we used to follow it every 48 hours, sometimes sooner if they're really sick in the ICU. I'm sure that your institutes would have their own protocols. And we know that the ferritin goes up and that we know that that's, a, that's an inflammatory state. Phagocytes, endothelial cells, tissue macrophages, they all contribute to the defense. In these pathological states, the normal host defense Uh, mucormycosis actually starts to invade more invasively into the tissue. Acidic pH, because DKA is an acidotic state, uh, causes, um, it says that my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear now we can. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Were you able to hear me, uh, hear whatever I was talking about in the last one minute or I can restart? We want to repeat that. Sure, I can. Uh, were you able to uh, hear my previous slide, or we, uh, or did it get choppy in this slide? I have a really poor internet connection here. Uh, we were still on pathogen host relationship. When Excellent. I think we uh, let me start. Let me restart relations. from this. So, like I was saying, there are a lot of complex interactions between uh, the host and the and the mucor, and mostly one of this is that uh, the fungus needs to take iron from the host. It needs iron to thrive. It has the same kind of 
uh, different type of fungal ferritin that it has in it. Uh, and in these disease states, we know that in COVID, uh, the body tries to save as much as iron by increasing it into the storage form into ferritin and to contribute to its defense. But in, <clears throat> in pathological states, the normal defense breaks down and there is endovascular invasion, which means that it invades through the blood into the tissue. Another mechanism is that in DKA, the pH is very acidotic. Um, and this acidotic pH, we know that uh, it's a ketoacidosis, acidotic state. The anion gap goes up and uh, the body has a lot of, of, uh, of unmeasurable anions. These actually cause the dissociation of free iron in, uh, and this causes, uh, and, and from the several sequestering proteins and thus promote rapid fungal growth, very rapid fungal growth. And this evades the host defense mechanism and the fungus is able to adhere to the tissues and hence uh, what we call as fungal angio invasion, vessel thrombosis, tissue necrosis, the black fungus, the black colored thing, this all necrotic tissue and then disseminated fungal infection. It has been known for decades that patients treated with iron chelator defroxamine have markedly increased invasive mucomycosis. But it's clear that iron chelation is not the mechanism by which defroxamine enables mucomycosis infections. Actually, uh, the uh, mucor is able to utilize uh, defroxamine as a siderophore um, to create or, or, or make previously unavailable iron available to itself, thus accumulating all this iron really fast. Um, it's a little bit more than the other fungi, Aspergillus and Candida, Candida, which we'll touch about in a bit. Uh, this increased intake of iron with increased uh, growth of the fungus in the blood um, is, has been shown to actually worsen, uh, worsen the disease state and it very rapidly progresses. Sometimes mucormycosis can progress very rapidly. Other times it's more of an indolent course in some patients where it takes a few weeks, like up to, up to uh, six weeks after they're discharged. Also, you can see this, which is why uh, uh, it's important to have good surveillance. Uh, moving on. In, um, in summary, it's, uh, some of these infections of mucor were diagnosed, like I said, days to weeks after the patients admitted with COVID. Um, uh, yeah, they are, are known to be secondary infections in critically ill patients on steroids. Steroids do increase the, uh, the sugar. It, they do create um, an immunocompromised state by many different mechanisms, and all these contribute to uh, worsening uh, Mucormycosis. Very rarely, uh, there have also been case studies shown uh, where patients treated with steroids have got gastric mucormycosis. These studies are available on, on PubMed freely. Um, there have been also known cases of associations between steroids and IL-6 inhibitors, anti-IL-6, tocilizumab. It's a, it's a very common combination to give steroids and tocilizumab to combat um, COVID-19 pneumonia, severe COVID-19 pneumonia, especially patients with ARDS. Um, very briefly, I'll talk about the types and classification. Uh, this is again uh, a classification which I'm, which uh, were from the various different types of uh, infection. The most classical form or the most common form is the rhinos or rhino orbital. It starts off like Dr. Singh had mentioned with the spores that get inhaled. The spores are present in the environment. It's an environmental. It's an endemic environmental uh, bug. It's present everywhere in the soil where moisture is there. And normally, like Dr. Singh said, it doesn't infect you, but when you have an immunocompromised state, uh, it tends to create more issues. So it, you inhale it through the nose and then it causes an acute sinusitis-like picture and spreads to the nearby structures through the mechanisms that I had explained. The palate, the orbit, eventually the brain, and it's rapidly progressing over a few days and very rarely over a few weeks, and which is why surveillance of these patients who you're discharging from the hospital is really important. Uh, there's no specific consensus on, on, on staging of the disease. Uh, there's no specific classifications uh, uh, classified as, I'm just classifying it according to the portal of entry from the nose and spreading deeper and deeper into the tissues and the uh, paranasal sinuses and eventually uh, into the orbit. So uh, the preparedness to face camcor is really multimodal. We should be aware of the warning signs. We should have a high index of suspicion, early diagnosis and appropriate referral. So the management of mucormycosis is really a team effort. We should be involving our infectious disease specialists very early. Uh, we should be involving the ENT specialists very early. We should get them to do the necessary endoscopic test to get the sample, uh, look at it under the lab. We should, get a, we should have a good... Uh, 
good connection with a good microbiology lab. And also early involvement of, uh, of ophthalmology and neurosurgery is also really important. We really want to try to save that eye. And the main problem is that uh, once the once you get into an orbital uh, mucormycosis, the risk of losing the eye is, is really high. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to recently uh, be involved in the care of this one young patient who uh, who, uh, who unfortunately contracted uh, orbital mucormycosis and uh, she had to have, uh, as a part of the debridement, she lost her eye. And uh, this patient unfortunately um, had to have extensive debridements and uh, we're still seeing how you know she's doing, but uh, really you wanna try to prevent that by identifying them really early. And uh, we will touch on uh, a small summary, like I said, tocilizumab steroids, diabetes, and six weeks it can happen post COVID treatment and mechanical ventilation and sick patients in the ICU are more uh, predisposed uh, to this. These are the red flags. Essentially, these are the clinical features that uh, that everybody should be looking out for. And uh, I've classified that according to the route of entry from major to minor. Of course, like uh, as you can see in this picture, we are seeing uh, that black fungus is not always black. There are white secretions and eschars in uh, in the fungus, and uh, these white eschars are actually actually the beginning stages of of the invasive process, creating exudate over there. So it's not always black. It can look as a white eschar. So these are the early stages and how it starts off because portal of entry is the nose. It starts with a sinusitis and spreads deeper and deeper, as like I said. You can have a very foul smelling discharge from the nose uh, and in later stages, black, uh, black discharge, black mucoid discharge, especially when more necrotic tissue is present, you can see more of black discharge. Um, palatal eschars, when you open and examine the mouth of these patients in their palate, they can have uh, eschars indicating a much more invasive uh, state over there. Uh, when you look at the nose, like, uh, like in picture number two, the turbinate looks almost destroyed um, and there's white uh, eschars and white secretions over there. Patients may also have regional pain. They might just complain of vague pains and they've been coming to you because they've had days of pain. Their history of COVID discharge successfully treated with a course of steroids and antibiotics. And now they're here with facial pain. They have a headache. Uh, headache is also an ominous sign and may be involved with much more serious uh, issues like, like shown in the picture that is actually a CT scan of the carotid showing a carotid thrombus uh, pro, uh, which was propagated by mucormycosis. Patients may also have a headache. Sometimes these invasive fungi can invade nervous structures and thus create neurological symptoms like facial nerve palsies, facial paresthesias. These are all uh, signs of more invasive disease. Ocular red flags is, uh, is actually one that's very scary to me because, uh, because this is what, uh, what we saw uh, very recently in a case and we want to try to avoid this because you essentially lose the eye once, you, once, this, uh, once this process gets much more severe. Proptosis, like shown in this picture, popping out of the eye. Ocular mobility destruction, this endophthalmitis like picture, panophthalmitis essentially because the eyelid is also involved. Eyelid and facial edema facial discoloration, facial distortion, all these are signs of invasion and should be looked out for. Everybody should do a thorough examination on these patients. A physical exam and a good history is very key to catch these cases early, especially uh, when they came in and they were treated with steroids and they got any immunomodulators or if they had pre-existing conditions, diabetes, which is why it's essential to monitor blood triggers of patients who are receiving steroids and really follow institutional international guidelines uh, for prescribing these really strong medications, these high doses of potent steroids. Dexamethasone is a high potency steroid. Of course, now there are some late symptoms. Uh, fever is the most specific, non-specific non, non sign. Even patients who get the COVID vaccine are getting fevers and would start worrying, hey, do I have the COVID? Um, mucormycosis is nonetheless no, no different. Uh, altered mental status is again an ominous sign and may indicate more of a uh, encephalitis kind of a picture. Uh, it may be even toxic metabolic because of multiple metabolic derangements happening in patients who are very sick with ARDS, hypoxia, and it may also be a sign of mucormycosis. And that's why clinical suspicion is very important. And, and that's what I want uh, you to have, to have a high clinical suspicion for these patients. Seizures, of course, is a, also a very um, a sign of invasive disease as well. Um, it may be because of many reasons. COVID patients may have seizures and mental status and even fevers for any many reasons, but clinically correlated with all these clinical signs and features might point to more of an invasive uh, fungal disease state. 
Now, there are some diagnostic tools. Uh, one of them, the first one I've put is a high index of suspicion. You should really look for it. You should know what it looks like in order to find it. Uh, this, there are some CT scans showing uh, showing uh, sinusitis, uh, early sinusitis with a very septated complex sinusitis as picture B. Um, so imaging modalities that you can use to diagnosis a CT with contrast, you can use MRI with gadolinium. Nasal endoscopy involving an ENT surgeon early is, is a good idea for these patients. Having an ENT on board is a good idea. I was reading in the news that a lot of task forces are already involving a lot of ENT surgeons. And uh, I think that that's a, a step forward to help these patients out. Can everybody still hear me? Is the mic, is the mic still clear? Yes. Yes, Excellent. we can Excellent. hear you properly. So then there are also molecular and serological uh, methods of, uh, of diagnosis. But essentially, imaging is what you would be getting first. It's a first, it's very fast and easy to get rather than waiting for a biopsy that takes a while. But again, uh, you do need to get these samples to make sure that like, what is the microbiology that you're dealing with, like Dr. Singh had mentioned, and, and also to find out what is the susceptibility because uh, many uh, institutes have their own protocols for treatment, which again is very institution dependent. And I will direct you towards sources of sources of treatment, but because of restrictions uh, from the Ministry of Health, I cannot talk about that at this present moment, but you can connect with me at a later time and we can talk about the various options and I will leave those details with you later on. My favorite slide, prevention. So really the prevention is a multimodal approach, which is which should come from higher up, which should come from beyond all of us. And it should be an institutional policy, uh, uh, antibiotic stewardship that's actually monitoring the steroid use in these patients. In our institute, we have a infectious disease specialist involved in the care of every single COVID patient who knows every single patient in the hospital. During the pandemic, essentially the entire hospital, which is a 400 bed hospital was a, was a COVID ward. There was a point where we even had patients uh, outside the wards and we, we had to create some space and everything, but we still had the infectious disease specialist on board who used to steward, who used to watch over what we're doing, make sure that it is evidence-based, it is backed up by research and not just, um, you know, out of compassionate use. A lot of times out of compassionate use, we do uh, treat, over-treat some, some, some illnesses, but uh, COVID is a pandemic state and, you know, it, out of compassionate use, we do sometimes give a little bit extra steroid, but that's why we uh, need the uh, antibiotic stewards. Supervised use of of tocilizumab. Every single dose of tocilizumab in our institute goes through antibiotic steward. And uh, we revisit and think whether the second dose is needed or not, in order to just avoid the, the complications that can happen. Uh, not just mucor, but also the can candida as well, which I'll get into in just a bit. Aseptic precautions, <clears throat> of course, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> aggressive glycemic control of these patients, monitoring finger sticks regularly, making sure that you know if they are diabetic patients that you are giving them the right amount of insulin. Sometimes um, it's, again, very institution specific uh, about what agent that you're using to treat. I've seen some institutes give NP NPH insulin. I've uh, seen some institutes give uh, Glargine, long-acting insulin, or some institutes that even give short-acting insulin. Whatever is the protocol developed uh, by the attendings, the, 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 the doctors higher up, we have to really stick to those protocols. That's, that's why um, having an institutional policy and a good antibiotic steward is very important. Masking of patients and staff, that's a no bueno. Uh, and prophylaxis as per institutional protocol. And of course, uh, vaccination. I didn't put this in the slide, but obviously vaccination prevents uh, them from being in the state that, that might require them to give them all these medications uh, in order to obviously curb this horrible illness. So my, the next part of my slide is actually, um, I was invited to talk about uh, the white fungus. Actually, this is Candida auris, uh, and Candida auris is a nosocomial infection, and uh, it's colloquially called the white fungus. And in this talk, I will be referring to this as Candida auris. It is a hospital-acquired nosocomial infection. It is highly multidrug resistant, and it has a high mortality. It is a, it, asymptomatic coloniz colonization is involved. Uh, a lot of people have been exposed to this and it doesn't really create a problem uh, unless you have an immunocompromised state. It's not, it's not something that you know, we uh, immunocompetent people should worry about. It is very endemic to India. I will show you why I think it is. And 
it's associated with a lot of things, including reuse of PPE. Uh, in our institute, we discard uh, PPE when we leave the room of every single patient. We have separate rooms for every patient, uh, but I know that wasn't the case when we were in the in the peak of the pandemic. And uh, we have also reused PPE quite a lot, but reuse of PPE is associated with this. Even double gloving. There is a study from uh, Florida from Christopher et al. Uh, where they showed that double gloving and they checked the microbiome in the glove in between and they found candida auris in that. So it's associated a lot with uh, our practices as well. It's been reported in over 30 countries as shown in the diagram from the CDC. Um, there is a study from uh, Rudramutri et al. in 2017 of candida candidemia in Indian ICUs. It's a very interesting study and I uh, came across. Uh, in this study, 27 uh, ICUs were studied and 19 out of 27 already had candida auris in their microbiological samples. This, this study dates pre-pandemic. So this is not something that really just showed up because of COVID. This is always there. But we're just seeing more of this now because of our patients who are immunocompromised because of all these things that I discussed about when we were talking about uh, mucormycosis. Uh, several, several different countries have described, uh, described this in their ICUs, uh, Africa, Europe, Japan, even the US. And the US actually has seen several different kinds of strains from several of these countries as well. And it's been a CDC alert since 2016. So none of this is really new. It's always really been there. Uh, the risk factors are patients who are in, who are ventilated in the ICU, who have a portal of exit of this, uh, mechanically ventilated patients. They are obviously a long-term mechanical ventilation. They, if they're requiring that, uh, there's been an issue trying to wean them off, uh, which might point towards an immunocompromised state by itself. Um, other multidrug resistant bugs. Uh, that they have also point out, points out to chronic illnesses, uh, recent broad spectrum antibiotic and antifungals. I'm going to just underline these two, vancomycin and meropenem is, is what uh, studies have shown to be more associated with the exposure to this has been more shown, shown to be more associated with colonization uh, with candida auris. Yeah, in the U.S., it's really the sickest of the sick patients who are in the ICU uh, who require that high level of care, who, uh, who are like really sick, just hanging on, just there who are, who've not got out of the woods yet. It's not a threat to the general public and this may colonize asymptomatically. I'm stressing on this because, uh, because I've seen uh, a lot of things in the news, but really it's not at all a threat for the general public. Um, uh, we have studies that shown that this prevalence in uh, in long-term acute care, this is basically like a long-term ICU where we wean patients of ventilators. Uh, it's pretty high, like 7.7, .7, but in patients who are not requiring mechanical ventilation, the incidence is very low uh, in the environment. So um, there are some challenges in uh, Canada Auris. Uh, some of these I will touch on. Persistent colonization. Um, persistent colonization. Some patients have been exposed to this in the environment and incidentally they just got exposed to COVID and now they have COVID pneumonia. They have a high risk of uh, invasive disease and they can even transmit this. This is something that actually can go from one patient to the other. Um, it's somewhat similar to Clostridium difficile where we actually have to gown up gloves and use soap for hand washing and all that good stuff. The same stuff comes in for Candida auris as well. It is something that you can spread uh, not just to the neighbor, but to the entire unit. Even if the patients are in separate rooms, separated by a glass door, it can still spread. And I'll come to why that happens. It's because it can persist in equipment for more than a month. Shared equipment, like blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, these are things that we share among different patients. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very easy to just like not sterilize it because you know all of this requires time I and mean, even a cold floor uh, which I have also been and I can totally understand that it takes quite a bit of effort but really wiping down that pulse ox with a good bleach based agent or at least like an alcohol for over 20 seconds has been shown to prevent this blood pressure cuff pulse ox surfaces the sides and railings of the bed the door to the ward the door of the bathroom any surface you can think of you touch that patient and you touch that you've basically imprinted uh, candida auris on it and that can be a portal of spread i have a small picture from the cdc that shows that, uh, that there are four different variants uh, there's the Japanese variant, the Indian variant, uh, the uh, South African variant, and the South American variant. And in the U.S., 
we've seen all these different kinds. And as, as you can see, New York is right here in that corner. And uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a bit of the Indian uh, variant as shown in that diagram. The clinical features are really somewhat not so different from other things. You get low-grade fevers to full-blown sepsis, so depending on how immunocompromised your patient is. You can have eye complications, chorioretinitis, get an ophthalmologist early, look into the eye with a fundoscope and look for the signs. Muscle abscesses, as shown in the second diagram, tender, warm, swollen muscle in a patient who's treated with COVID. Think about candida oris sepsis. Uh, abscess, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, skin, you can have painless postures with an erythematous red base that can form in. It's typical of candidal skin infections. And, and we know that that happens in a lot of immunocompromised -com patients like HIV patients. We see that quite a lot. And this, uh, suspect this when you have this infective state and you get blood cultures, your patient is really sick, but your blood cultures are very negative, then what's going on? Really, at that point, you got to think outside the box. This worsens to multi-organ failure very rapidly. The diagnosis has actually improved since the awareness has improved. Like in 2016, the CDC declared this uh, a global alert for this already. This is not at all new. We're just seeing this now. And India has always been, uh, and this has always been endemic to India. It's always been there. And, and, and studies have shown this always has existed in ICUs in India. Uh, we must have a high index of suspicion, which I hope that uh, all of uh, the viewers get that idea after, after uh, this information that you've got. The gold standard is really blood culture. Uh, we have the MALDI, which is the matrix assisted laser de de uh, desorption ionization. This is a device. Many labs in India have this. Uh, then there are other things like the T2 DEX uh, candida instrument and the RT PCR. There are some limitations for the RT PCR. Uh, but the MALDI and the Vitec, they're standardized equipment. Another blood test is the Fungitel. Uh, that's a brand name, which is the Beta D Glucan. It's got high sensitivity, but low specificity, which means that other fungal infections can also have that. But empirically, if you decide to start a treatment, uh, a Fungitel, a negative Fungitel can essentially um, help you to discontinue the antifungal early and not subject to patients because the antifungals that you use are pretty hardcore stuff. Uh, it's not the general azoles and the polyenes. Again, um, I'm talking about the treatment of this because uh, as per the uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, there are only some restrictions about the uh, the management of mucormycosis. However, I didn't see anything for candida auris, so hence I'm going to proceed with talking about a little bit about the treatment, so just to create some general awareness. Azole antifungals, quite resistant, 87.6. doesn't seem like a good choice once you've made the diagnosis of uh, candida auris. Polyenes, amphotericine, liposomal or, or otherwise, 33.7, not a good choice. You need to use echinocandins. These are the drugs that you should use, and these are quite hardcore stuff. Uh, but this is what is least resistant to it. And this is why having an antibiotic steward to back you up, having the infectious disease specialist uh, back you up, and really have more minds to think about this is important because these, these medications, you have to be sure that, you know, your patient deserves this medication or not. Um, the management, you know, candidates, like I said, resistance testing has to be done. You obtain that sample, obtain the sample from the site, uh, get the blood cultures, MALDI, whatever is the institutional policy, wherever you work. Uh, there's no transmission of resistance. There are some newer antifungals like the Rezafungin and the APX001 or the Fosman or GPEX. Um, these drugs are really for compassionate use only if your patient is, this is like a last uh, resort for your patient for a confirmed case. And these are all trial drugs. So that is why, you know, this has to be done after full informed consent and explaining to the patient exactly what they're signing up for or the next of kin, whoever is making the decisions for your patient. Prevention. This is my favorite slide. It's really hand hygiene. And I put this picture in just to create, just to let all you guys know, rub all the surfaces, all the equipment that you use. Uh, if you can't, uh, you know, discard your PPE because of shortages, at least use a single glove and, and alcohol wipe your, your glove. This is not something that will affect an immunocompetent host. If you're a COVID frontline worker, this is not going to affect you. It's only going to help your patients who have this illness. Rub it with alcohol. 
20 seconds. This is really what we do for, for anything, not just candida. This is more like a standard precaution, rubbing, uh, rubbing your hands with alcohol for 20 seconds, making sure that all the surfaces, all the nails, keeping your nails short and rubbing it off with alcohol is a good idea. For, don't forget the web of the hands, alcohol, wipes, soap, they all work. Uh, but really hand hygiene is more of a part of standard precautions, which we should do for every patient, really. Prevention also with PPE precautions, contact precautions. You treat this like you treat like you you treat this like when you're entering the room of a clostridium difficile patient. You're gonna wear a gown, you're gonna wear gloves, and you know you maintain contact precautions. And before you meet the next patient, you disinfect or you discard your PPE. Uh, remove and change gloves and gown before every new patient, if possible. But I understand that there's always a PPE shortage, and I myself have been on the front lines and uh, have been uh, a victim of that. In fact, at one point um, we were. Uh, we even uh, saw the CDC tell us to wear bandanas. So I can totally get uh, why they would say such a thing when you know we have a PPE shortage. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting all equipment, door handles, lights, which is anything that you touch or the patient touches should be cleaned. And I know it's a hard thing to do, but we try to do what best we can. Um, clean as much as possible, including the mobile equipment and across the unit. It should not be just that patient. It should be every single patient because studies have shown that if you're one patient in one room has it, all the patients on the floor has it. And this is backed up by high quality evidence. And this is easily available evidence. It's available. So to summarize, what can we do? Uh, what can we do to get prepared? We arm ourselves with the information. That's what is presented in these slides, which I, uh, which I hope that you know we can make available for all you guys. Um, Evidence-based sources: the ICMR, the WHO, CDC, up to date. Uh, this should be our sources of information that we arm ourselves with. Whatever is the institutional policy, wherever you work, we should create good policies and follow those policies strictly. And we should use these as as the base. Creating institutional uh, protocols and task forces, which. Over the past week, we've seen several task forces emerge, and I think that's a very positive sign, and that makes me happy. Uh, ramping up on vaccination, uh, maybe improve protocols to improve vaccination of patients in a safe way. That definitely is going to help prevent all these things because you vaccinate, you prevent disease. Here in New York, we uh, we just got relaxed of all restrictions. In fact, we don't have to wear masks when we go in for restaurants and no more social distancing anymore. I, I um, have mixed opinions about that, uh, but I leave that to the policymakers. In our institute, we continue to wear masks and in hospitals, the state law, we continue to wear masks and uh, try to stay a little distanced away from everybody. And then of course, uh, everybody goes vaccinated. Vaccinated people, according to state law, do not have to wear masks anymore. That's a good sign of like a very high vaccination rate, which would definitely help. Indian vaccination rates from the last numbers were less than 10 or 15%. I don't have the exact figures with me. Uh, the data is a little bit mixed, but vaccination should be ramped up. And finally, I kept this for the last, but essentially this should be the first thing is chronic disease management. And I think there's a talk that's coming up on uh, management of diabetes and COVID in a few days, but uh, chronic disease management is very important and managing diabetes uh, is, and, and doing effective diabetes strategies is, is going to be a good thing for your patients. In conclusion, high index of suspicion, early diagnosis, effective treatment with the highest evidence-based treatment uh, from sources that are highly reliable, um, multimodal treatment involving your infectious disease specialist, your surgeons, if necessary, for mucormycosis, um, having a good connection with a nice lab, creating a good connection so that you can get all these lab tests done in an effective manner, uh, institutional policy, and uh, preventive strategies, with that, which, again, should be really on the top of the slide. But... Um, Again, uh, as a disclosure, these views are independent of my affiliations. I am a medical resident and to be a chief resident uh, at my institute here. Uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to conclude by saying that I have left some guidelines uh, for the treatment of uh, mucormycosis on the top right. You would find a QR code for the website for the ICMR treatment guidelines. On the bottom right, you'll find some guidelines for the AIMS treatment guidelines. Uh, I don't have any financial disclosures uh, and I have uh, my email address in case anybody wish to correspond with me later on after the talk. If you uh, wish to uh, talk about, uh, if you wish to talk about your experience, I would like to connect with you at a personal level. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, we can always speak. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you, Dr. Google. Gayatri, maybe we have to see the Q&A and maybe we can start checking out the questions, whatever the uh, you know attendees have asked. Sure, Samia.
Thank you, Doctor, once again for the presentation uh, filled with facts, stats, and their uh, experiences, of course. Uh, we have a few questions for both the doctors here. Um, the first one is from uh, Dr. Sayan, uh, Sayan, Dr. Sayan Bhattacharya. Is iron chelator a risk factor for mucomycosis? Singh, Dr. Gopal Ramani, uh, would you like to take this question? Well, iron chelators were classically thought to be a cause of mucormycosis, but uh, there is some some evidence that shown that uh, iron, chel iron chelation is uh, shown to be a cause of mucormycosis, but uh, there are some conflicting evidence, so it's really a mixed uh, thing. Um, so uh, I'm not really sure about my opinion about that. Maybe Dr. Singh can, uh, can uh, weigh in. Dr. Singh, can you hear us? Could you unmute, please? Yeah. What is the, the question? The, the question is: Is iron chelator a risk factor for mucormycosis? I think Dr. Singh is muted again. Another question. Gayatri, you there? Yes, Soumya. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Singh. Yeah. There was another question from one of the attendees. What is the rate of recovery after exposure to these invasive fungal infections? So, um, that's a great question. It really depends on what stage you catch these. If you catch the catch them at a stage where they have a lot of rhino cerebral orbital invasive mucormycosis, uh, your treatment, your your cure is going to be a, a, a really surgical. You have to debride all those tissues. You know, all these necrotic tissues is going to be a focus for more uh, for more mucor. Uh, early mucormycosis can be treated with uh, with antifungals. If you have a more invasive disease, it's more for surgical. Uh, situation where uh, the chance of cure is going to be um, the chance of cure is the eradication of disease uh, might not be entirely uh, the goal. It's it's really to treat and minimize the complications and pick up the host immune immune response. Well, a lot of these patients are immunocompromised, and you want the immune system to pick up. Um, we still have a case that uh, that's been going on for a few months now. We say like a couple of months. So. Um, so the rate of recovery, I guess, is very variable. It can really vary from um, you catch that early and treat it with antibiotics to um, to more of an it can become invasive. It can even ca even in immunocompetent hosts, we've seen that once it becomes invasive, uh, uh, really the prognosis is poor. Yeah. I 
Thank you, Dr. Ramani. Uh, Dr. Singh, do you have any comments you would like to uh, share on this question? I think we've lost Dr. Singh there. Yeah. Let's um, go to the next question. Yes. Yeah. We may have uh, time for a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to the previous question, I think we have uh, one which is very similar and related. Um, so our audience has asked if there are any ways to manage mucomycosis patients at home if diagnosed at the initial stages. That's a tough, uh, tough question, really, because um, I don't have any experience treating mucormycosis patients at home. Uh, mucormycosis essentially is uh, something that requires uh, multiple teams, including your infectious disease specialist, your ophthalmologist to look into the eye. Uh, you need your neurosurgeon, your ENT specialist to do a functional endoscopy and look at the nose, look at the sinuses, get a, get a, get a diagnosis. And um, management with these drugs, even if it's like um, some of these liposomal kind of drugs, I don't want to get into specifics for legal reasons, but these drugs require high monitoring. The non-liposomal form of uh, azole anti of, of azole antifungals, like of um, of of amphotericin uh, of amphotericin B and everything, requires monitoring in an ICU. I, I'm not sure if that's something that can be managed at home. Uh, I don't have any experience. I have managed COVID patients at home. We can definitely do that. With mucormycosis, um, it's uh, something of a little bit more serious situation that might require a higher level of care uh, that may not be uh, given at home. But then again, uh, there might be institutional policies coming up in India that may have uh, tailored treatments uh, at home, but I don't have any experience treating uh, these patients at home. So I, I, I don't know if we can treat them at home. That's a good question. Thank you, doctor. That takes us to the next question on what is the evidence of vancomycin and meropenem associated with candida as said? And how is vancomycin a broad spectrum antibiotic? Vancomycin is not a broad spectrum antibiotic. It's a very narrow spectrum antibiotic used in specifically for MRSA. But in critically ill patients, say you have a very sick patient in the ICU, you're going to give them broad spectrum like vancomycin and piperazole and tazobactam. These are broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, there is evidence for, uh, for giving these combination of drugs. Uh, this is, again, evidence from the CDC. And there are several studies I will be sending one in uh, to you. I think I just sent a link. I don't know if that you received that link that I just uh, sent in. 
but uh, there are several uh, studies uh, that back up the cdc recommendation and in the cdc website uh, you'll find the evidence uh, and uh, there are even several uh, there's several data available in the cdc and some studies that you can obviously pull, pull up on pubmed that show mirofenum there was a study that i just sent to you that uh, based in i believe italy that uh, that looked at patients who got uh, candida auris and these uh, these patients all the patients that stayed were exposed to meropenem at that time so uh, there is uh, evidence floating around uh, that shows that these uh, prospective antibiotics is associated with uh, this infection and again it's a cdc guideline as well thank you doctor i think the uh, paper that you just shared it should now be available for our audience to access in the answered section of the q and a window uh the final question that we will take for today is whether nitric oxide has any role in the prevention of complications associated with mucormycosis um i'm not aware i'm not so sure uh, if nitric oxide has a role in prevention we i don't have any experience using nitric oxide uh in uh, i don't have any experience using nitric oxide period i don't use it so i don't know thank you samya i don't see any further questions from our audience um yeah even i was checking like whether do we have any more questions but i think uh, that's it just i i just wanted to know like why is that a sudden increase of uh, mucor maybe we haven't seen that kind of numbers in first wave of covid but uh, during a second wave of covid we are seeing the numbers more what would be the uh, reason well um it might be because of number one we don't have enough data from the first covid pandemic uh, somia we don't know how many patients actually got that is that data is not really available to us uh, this is something which we kind of picked up and then we made a task force and we started really tracking it making it and making it a epidemic um Uh, then more the second wave we're seeing more patients get infected as well this is really the big wave uh, this is what we had last year in new york um also a lot of patients like the a uh, uh, lot of trials have shown that dexamethasone is helpful for treatment of these patients that's a high potency steroid we've been using that a lot in the beginning when uh, when the covid pandemic first started uh, my team and i we were using uh, uh medroxyprogesterone acetate uh, different kind of steroid for treatment of these patients uh, there is a high potency steroid as well we were giving high doses but now we've been using dexamethasone it stays in the system for longer so you just you give the last dose of steroid our institutional policy is to give it for 10 days um we might give it for a little bit more um you discharge that patient after the 10th day they still have that in their system they still have that in their system uh, and uh, you know nobody's monitoring the blood sugars when they go home and uh, that's going to what these steroids do they increase your blood sugar and this increased blood sugar is going to make it difficult for you know the host to mount an immune response and uh, that uh, might be a contributing factor um, then there are many mechanisms and many things that we don't quite understand about why this happens so mucormycosis mucor is present in the environment it's present in the soil it's there everywhere and um, like uh really we still don't understand fully fully why this spike is happening uh we just know that there are a lot of mechanisms that play play part that make us predisposed to get this infection and we are recording the cases now and we are actually seeing that recorded cases uh now of mucormycosis and uh and we are more aware of it and once we are more aware of something we pick it up and uh, and the number get number gets inflated then so Uh, um dr singh uh, even uh, i have read couple of your interviews on uh, white fungus and you know black fungus and uh, you have also mentioned maybe we need to revamp the treatment for uh, covid patients that is why we are seeing so much of mucor cases in post covid scenario can you just uh, give a brief or just give your thoughts like how we can uh, you know avoid or how we can uh, manage um you could uh, patients or what is your opinion in that we should uh, restrict the uh, steroid therapy excess excess of venetic is that that applies here also we should restrict uh, uh, steroid therapy is good no doubt but excessive use of steroid therapy is not steroid is not good at all and uh, we we should control diabetes also because it's observed in uh, 
one control type equation. Thirdly, we should um, we should uh, take care of hygiene also. We take care of uh, sterility of humidifier uh, of, of human oxygen cylinder is also important, and we should use a, a biological oxygen. But uh, we use this wave, but in uh, the second wave, industrial oxygen was used, which may be one of the reasons, because industrial oxygen is not very pure, as pure as this biological so this would be one of the reasons. One covered diabetes and the uh, over use of uh, steroids and uh, hygiene is hygiene and use of biological oxygen is uh, the factor which should be taken care of. Okay, doctor. I think we have one question in the chat box. Is overuse of zinc is another factor for fungal infection surge? Any, anyone can answer. Like overuse it. Yeah. I, I have no idea how it acts. What is the mechanism behind this? But I have also heard that uh, overuse of zinc is also should also be avoided. Excess of anything is uh, uh, not good. Excess of anything, there is hypervitaminosis. Hypervitaminosis is also a factor. So hyper use of overuse of zinc and other minerals. If we use anything in excess, that is not good. So I have no idea of how it acts, but overuse of anything including zinc is not good. It should be avoided. Overuse of any drugs, any minerals, any vitamins should be avoided. Yeah, I, I concur uh, with Dr. Singh. I'm not very really aware of, um, of what uh, or how zinc can do uh, this, but uh, if uh, if you know any mechanism, then I would be very interested to uh, if you would shoot me an email and tell me about it. Not really aware of zinc uh, causing it, but uh, I concur with Dr. Singh. Okay, uh, I have one more question. Are children more at risk of getting mucormycosis? Anyone can answer. Um, just as a disclosure, I'm an adult physician. I'm not a pediatrician. Uh, I'm not really aware of. We don't. I don't treat children uh, with uh, with coronavirus. So I'm not really sure uh, about that. Uh, that'd be a good question for a pediatrician or a, or a patient who or a physician who treats uh, uh, pediatric patients with COVID. Uh, unfortunately, I treat adult patients, uh, 18 and older. Uh, but uh, maybe Dr. Singh can weigh in uh, on this. Okay, I'm answering. I don't think so. Children, uh, children are uh, children. Is good as compared to sixty plus or I'm quoting uh, in uh, in our M Patna, fifteen children from uh, age in the uh, in the age group two to eighteen came for the vaccination, and on um, after antibody test. 12 were declared to be antibody positive. It means 12 had corona infection, COVID infection, and they were cured only. So, so only three children were selected. So children have high immunity, of course, there is no doubt about it. And they are, um, they are, they can recover very fast. If, uh, if we, um, in other words, we can say that out of 15, 12 were infected and they they conquered, they had conquered for us and they, they were having antibodies when they applied. So 80% of the children were, uh, had corona infection, it was, which was revealed by antibody testing in our aim. 
for children or um, children we should not uh, bother much for the children children i have children have already been infected and they have become because uh, they have cured uh, themselves also. Uh, they have uh, got rid of this for them so children i don't think children are more uh, vulnerable to this people uh, like because they have a strong immunity as compared to adults or people of the same class of people of the same class okay doctor uh, we have uh, one more question is mucosomycosis uh, prevalent earlier in india or covid enhanced it if it is covid then why in second wave like maybe yes we have answered that because we have seen the sudden increase of number of patients and we have started using you know industrial oxygen but again still maybe i would like to ask the speakers to answer this question definitely mucormycosis was always uh, if presented. we compare the two mm-hmm. yes it was present but it is not as common as candida we we are coming across candida now day to day plan in the practice oral candida vaginal candida and the in the old old person oral lesion and in the cell bed in fact every candida is very very common before your case is in a in the so uh, candida is comparatively much more common than that is suppose if we, if we if we if we count 100 cases culture 100 fungal free a medium Uh, 80 75 80 at this candid only less than 5 is free. so maybe it was uh, not very common there is no doubt about it but a sudden rise uh, these are the factors that we already discussed the health the diet the overuse of steroids with the low dose excessive use of steroids was the main reason and uh, i think industrial oxygen should also be taken care of should also be included some of the main reasons. i think that um, we don't have any more questions gayatri i guess yes so uh, soumya Yeah, I think we don't have any more questions. Maybe we can uh, summarize the um, webinar and we can close. Great, thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, both Dr. Gokul Ramani and Dr. Uh, Singh for their participation today, taking time off their schedules, addressing different questions, and sharing their experiences and uh, you know, facts. I'd also like to thank all the participants for joining us on this session today on a Saturday afternoon. As for certificates, all the participants will re- receive their certificates via email. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact the organizer, Ms. Saumya. I also want to remind you there is another session on the 18th of this month on the same subject of mucomycosis. We will have another eminent um, doctor addressing the audience. If you need more information, you would need to contact the organizer, Ms. Samia Agar. I'd once again like to thank everybody for participating and their contribution in um, assisting the country with this pandemic. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.